Thank you for tuning in to today's episode of the Breaking Changes podcast. I'm your host and chief evangelist for Postman, Ken Lane. With Breaking Changes, we explore the world of APIs through the lens of business and engineering leadership. Joining me today, we have Deepa Goyo, product manager at PayPal. Deepa's consumer-driven view of the API lifecycle, the maturity of our APIs, and her approach to analytics in service of product management, I found very educational. Who are you and, Absolutely. and what do you do? So I'm Deepa, uh, and I'm currently product manager for API experiences at PayPal. Uh, my background is actually, I started my career, uh, you know, I studied computer science engineering, and I went into data engineering. I was, during engineering, I discovered that I was very passionate about data. So I very consciously shaped most of my career in the data space, from data engineering to analytics, and then eventually data science. Once I started doing data science and partnering with product managers to build more data, using data, building products, it, eventually I decided to transition into product management. And I was working at a fintech startup at the time, and data is a very core part of products uh, in fintech. So it was a very nice, smooth transition for me. And I was actually attending coding conferences with my developers just out of curiosity. And that's how I got interested in APIs. And I discovered how APIs got developers really excited. And I started looking into it and playing around with them. And eventually I joined Twilio uh, where I got to work on APIs uh, as a product manager. Uh, and to now where I'm shaping PayPal's API experiences and looking into how we can make them better. Wow, that's uh, quite a journey. I, I mean, and, and to, go, to go straight to Twilio from, from the, uh, your previous work, I think, I mean, you can't think of a better API to go join, I think, in my opinion. I mean, as far as to learn how things are, because they're one of the, I mean, they're one of the gods, the API gods, I would say, as far as doing APIs in the, in the mind of a developer. Um, it's it's one of the most useful, innovative. Jeff Lawson's, uh, uh, you know, as a, as a CEO and a leader, I always thought it's just a, it's a great company, and everyone I've ever known that worked there um, enjoys APIs and gets APIs. So, um, absolutely, I think so, Twilio has always been such a thought leader, and they have so much participation in the developer community. I think it was really interesting to kind of learn how they do it and how they think about it. So I got to learn a lot uh, from that experience. It was, they're very innovative about their approach towards shaping APIs as products. Uh, I was just was talking to you about some other issues where we've been work, partnering and, and working on PayPal and Postman related stuff. And then I just kind of fell into your journey and how you got here, but the the depth of your experience and I, I i was fascinated by how you kind of learned not learned about apis because you were working with them into fintech but like how you 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 just immersed yourself in in a, the world of apis and and apis as a product and all of these concepts but you had an interesting story about how you got here and and kind of the the lack of information that that was available to you so so can you can you recap for us like uh, how, where did you go to get all your knowledge and information? I mean, was it at Twilio or was there other places that you went went to get it? So, yeah, absolutely. There was, I think even at Twilio when I, when I joined there, I think there was so much information I wish I had before I joined. There's just, I, I realized that there isn't much information or learning material around how to think about APIs as products. There is a lot of fun projects, and I used to play around with them to do little things, build little bots, little applications. Every, nearly all the content is geared towards engineers on how to build APIs, the technical side of it, how to scale them, how to make them more robust and scalable. But things like, how do you monetize an API? Like, it's just not really there is there any standards to monetizing apis and a lot of times i think when 
big large enterprises are using other large enterprise apis to build products only they know uh, you know how the how the bills are getting paid it's not something mm-hmm. that's openly available uh mm-hmm. to to just somebody trying to learn about about apis and like how does twilio make money exactly how did they figure out how to make money from apis uh and all these other companies they're so innovative there's so such a variety of apis but there just wasn't information on how they shape the pricing strategies or how they how do you start to define an mvp for an api product for example <laughs> so as a product manager i really did not have any reference so i was leaning heavily on on mentors in the industry and just really just asking people uh, you know look looking for insights from developers uh and trying to understand how if they were to build an api from scratch how would they go about it about thinking about it uh and a lot of times just asking them to try out an api and share feedback so that was my way of figuring out a little bit of user research and a little bit of just ad hoc analysis <laughs> we we focus on the consumption of apis pretty heavily and how to build on apis and 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 that world of developers and then there's quite a bit of information about producing apis from vendors though I, and 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 telling you how you should be doing apis and then there's gartner and analyst and then i would say there's a handful of us and i include myself in this bucket is uh we're kind of the pundits or the analysts or the um and we write books and we we talk about how you should do APIs. And this is this actually this is why it struck me at my core is this is why I'm at Postman, is because I was an API pundit or personality for a decade and told lots of stories about doing APIs where I mentioned, hey, you should do APIs as a product a lot. But I never tell you how to do it, or I never give you the, the instructions on how to do it. And so this is very much why I'm at Postman, is, is I want to start showing and demonstrating how you do things. But I, I found it fascinating that your, your point that there's not a lot of books on, on APIs as a product, or there's not a lot of just really uh, foundational information for people to start, product managers to start their careers. Exactly. And lately I have been spending a lot of time thinking about what is API experience and what are the key components? Like, for example, developers are now used to seeing an API status page when they are using APIs of some company, but there is, isn't really a book that says that must publish an API status page. (laughs) Yeah. So as a product manager, when I'm thinking about what are the fundamental pieces that developers expect there to be? What do these pieces do for them? What is the value that is delivered? Uh, and of course, going into how do I measure it? Uh, that's where I spend most of my time uh, thinking about. So you mentioned analytics, um, just just a little bit in there, and understanding. So there's a lot of talk around API management and, and and having analytics at the API management layer that you should you should measure how people are consuming APIs because this this helps you drive your roadmap, drive your features, drive drive what you're going to be adding into the API based upon how people are using it. But we really beyond just like what APIs people are using and errors, there's not a lot of guidance on uh, what else I should be thinking about? I mean, yes, up, down, errors, but as a product manager, what do I need to know at that layer? What type of analytics are going to be critical to to my success as a product manager? Absolutely. And I, I think of analytics in a couple of different dimensions because at different stages of the product maturity, there's different metrics that matter. At different stages of the customer journey, there's different metrics that matter. So it's a it's a pretty multi-dimensional uh, aspect of of developing products. 
so for example, there is a, a pretty big piece of discovery for APIs. How do, how do developers find out about uh, an API? And there's so many different ways that they can discover an API. And the same way that in marketing, we have advertising channels, our marketing channels, that they did a customer discover it through Instagram or through Facebook and mar marketing experts would spend so much time optimizing that budget. The same way in APIs, there is there are a couple of different steps. There's a couple of different channels. Like developers can come to know about an API through some blog, through a YouTube channel, through our documentation. I think of those things as the same way somebody would think of, of marketing channels. And those are, in terms of developer journey, that's when developers kind of learning about it, trying to figure out if this API would be valuable to them. And there is, of course, a lot of different ways that people can learn things. So there's also this aspect of how people learn, because not everybody just reads a long docs page to learn. People, <laughs> some people prefer to learn from an audiobook, some people prefer to learn from a video with some people mm -hmm. like those infographic videos. It's just such a vast variety of, of ways people learn. So combining that with channels and then as a product manager, I'm trying to understand my customer base developers. What do they like? What serves them best? That's, that's an important distinction because it's not just people who are it's it's me as a product manager understanding how people discover find things what matters to them what's important and kind of the i don't know the the frequency or the the way their brain works what's going to you know how they're going to to want to understand do they want to play with it seeing sample applications seeing a live stream seeing reading the blog watching videos based upon that that's a wealth of data about who they are and what they're going to want as far as the capabilities of the api am i correct yeah absolutely yeah so that's a uh, um i mean so now how do i get how do i gather that you know i i'm i'm putting you know i'm creating this experience i'm putting out these these aspects of that experience and then i'm measuring as that comes in do I weave that into my feedback loop with these users? Like how, how, what else do I do to, to measure and understand what's going on at this layer so that I can in, um, build the best AP, next version of the API for them? So from measuring perspective, I think uh, there is a lot of the discovery metrics that we kind of think, think of in terms of like time to first hello world is probably like the, the best mm -hmm. starting point. Uh, you know, time the time between somebody creates uh, their account and gets their API keys to making their first API call is mm -hmm. like a great way to measure. Uh, we can get information around how many people are essentially uh, viewing our documentation of that, what percentage are actually ending up in their first API calls and try to to measure various aspects of various pages that are performing better or various uh, various pages that are driving more traffic. So I also broke that down a little bit in terms of like from an analytics standpoint, I think there is all this metrics that we can build around just the documentation and how that impacts discovery and all this other uh, metrics that we measure in terms of the API usage itself, because after the discovery of making discovery, the conversion is essentially the first API call. You have discovered the API. You may have come from a YouTube video or you've come from a blog or you've seen the documentation. You made the first API call. And then it's the next step in the user journey where you're scaling your usage. And that has sort of its own set of things like does a customer go from one uh, one API call to 500 in a day or a week or a month. Like how how long does it take for customers who scale to scale? 
and what what is the reason what are the pain points that take them longer in, when it does so there's a whole set of things that we discover uh, we can discover just measuring those times of time to scale and and does this apply similarly to and i mean you you said it's multi-dimensional so does it apply internally as well as public apis because if i've got or beta apis like if i'm just put the maturity you talked about that if i put out a beta yeah. api um am i going to measure it in the same ways or am i going to have a different set of or are those those data points going to mean different things I think the data points might mean the same thing, but I think what what differentiates like a beta API versus a GA API, uh, and I can talk about that terminology a little bit more, uh, I think is really the customer expectation. Uh, and it's really interesting. I, I, was, I was really thinking about what defines a beta API versus a general availability API. How do we make that distinction? And I kind of look look to the documentation of a lot of different companies. Uh, of course, I, I'm more familiar with Twilio, uh, having worked there, but I also looked at things like Okta, Shopify, uh, Microsoft. And I really noticed that there isn't a very standard terminology around what is a beta API, what is a GA API. It's really every company kind of defines their own. Uh, and it, that was that really stood out to me. But I think in general, at a high level, what everybody's trying to do is set customer expectations in terms of, as a customer, if I'm using beta API, then I'm building a dependency on a product that may not be mature, that might undergo mm -hmm. changes. So it's really a business decision that do I really trust using a product that might change? might break my application. And uh, another interesting thing I've seen is the difference in SLAs. Uh, a lot of times these API companies would actually lay out clearly that if uh, the, the, the different SLAs that they define for a beta product versus a general availability product. So I think there is, the maturity label is really driving transparency and trust for the end customer trying to build applications using these APIs. Uh, so from a product perspective, if I'm managing a beta product, then to some degree, I know what customers expect, that it is not completely a mature product. From a product standpoint, I might be engaging more with those customers, getting more uh, interaction and more one-to-one -one inputs from them as I shape the product into a general availability product. Uh, and if I'm product managing a general availability product, I can expect that the customers expect a very high uh, bar for quality. And they also expect that the API shouldn't change in a way that it breaks their application. So I think the expectations changes at every level of maturity of APIs. Do you feel that there should be a standardized vocabulary for how we describe uh, like what is GA and what is beta and, and like how that applies to each API, parameter, path, pricing, SLA? Is there like a, is there a standard framework we should be considering there? I think it would be really helpful uh, in quite a few different ways. I think it would be great, for example, to get more more product managers to be able to enter API product management space. It's definitely going to, uh, if we had this kind of standardized uh, vocabulary that can uh, be shared with new entrants and APIs in general, I think it would be it would be helpful. Also for engineers, I think it might potentially make uh, some some kind of standardization might help them take that knowledge across as they use a variety of APIs because a lot of time developers are using a lot of different APIs. So having to learn each API's own standard, it might actually help to have a standardized definition. Yeah, so answer is yes, absolutely. Interesting, because I'm, so I'm part of a working group that is working on an SLA standard for the open API specification. 
So how do you describe for an API, you have this API that has this path, these parameters, this request and response, and you can get post put, it's got you know a handful of methods. Now, what's our pricing? What are we charging for that? What's our uptime uh, promise of, of, of threshold performance as well as the mm -hmm. overall availability? And then how do and then what's our what's the standard for monitoring that status page you talked about? And then how do we reconcile that? And then do we give you a discount? Do we and so it seems like I haven't seen anything that says here's what GA is, here's what beta is, that maybe we could add a property to the top of the open API specification that would would say here's beta, here's this API, here's here, it's not just the version of the API, because we have a place to put the version, but if we had a place for right. maturity and then say it's GA beta or, you know, um, alpha, you know, but come up and then that would set, then you go, okay, here's the configuration for the SLA, here's the configuration for the monitoring and uptime, and it would adjust that for you. Yeah, very interesting. I hadn't even, I hadn't even yeah, considered okay. that. And, I think I think standardizing it uh, across the life cycle of the API in terms of you know if how mature it is and uh, just just overall I think it it would really help to kind of evolve the API space. I think uh, we have reached a point where there are enough uh, companies and people who are aware of APIs that uh, I think it's a, it's the right time. To, to arrive at the uh, at this uh, standard yeah and and I mean I've actually encountered several conversations lately about how do we train how do we define the, the product manager the API product manager role and how do we we onboard them and give them equip them with as, as much knowledge and information and enablement not just like here's go read all of this these books or anything but like how do we give them specifications and standards to work with and, and in their job, as well as the tooling, the API management, Postman, different things that they can use. And, um, and so this is very much trying to stabilize that world so we can scale it. We need more product managers. We need more API product managers and competent ones. There's, there's definitely a shortage. So that's what really stood out when I was talking to you the other day and, and kind of triggered this conversation is, is your view of hey, there's not enough knowledge on well, what is APIs a product? How do you do this? Let alone all the way to standards and specifications that would help with this and 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 help help us figure it out from the and but you also talked about the trust. It's going to increase the trust and the confidence of the product manager, but it's going to create trust with the consumers as well if they're able if they know if those expectations are set. Should it, do you think it also should govern like how we communicate or how like support tickets and and that feedback loop as well between producer and consumer? Absolutely. I was, I was just going to say that, that it should really uh, drive how a product is supported because a beta, beta API may not uh, need the same level of support as a, a general availability API. So from a, Product manager standpoint, I do actually monitor how many tickets we're getting at any point on a weekly basis. And I think the expectation is that at some point your product is mature enough that people are not running into foundational issues uh, like getting set up uh, or things like that. And I think supportability of APIs definitely should be tied into the maturity. Uh, of the APIs, and as it matures, it's it's a great way to measure how it, it's actually a great way to measure how mature an API is. If a lot of people are just able to self serve, get started without any help. Yeah, and that time to first call that, like, I think a lot of uh, uh, product managers or the, the developers building can say, "Oh, we're not adding any more features, or it's it's reached a maturity level based upon our gut feeling." But this is actually saying, hey, let's actually have measure and actually quantify well, how mature it is based upon the, the, the number of error tickets, the, you know, how many people can self-serve 
and actually get on board and not just one track like documentation like you said they should be able to come from different directions and be able to onboard with an api without any help and then activate and then start increasing the number of calls but then also activate across api so the number of apis they're using and the maturity of that as well another interesting uh, metric that that is very useful is actually not just time to first api call but first time to first transaction. And transaction, for example, in a, in a FinTech could be the first actual money movement. Uh, mm -hmm. That might take a few calls uh, for a customer to get to, but that's really success when they have made their first payment. Uh, and could be different things for different APIs, of course, but like first transaction. Is is very valuable. The other thing that that is that I find very useful is number of API calls for every transaction. How many API calls does it take to make a successful transaction? Because that yes. really helps me understand if our API is like too complicated, and maybe we can yeah. optimize it. That's funny. That reminds me of. Um... 2012, I think it was, it was at a Mashery um, API conference. So Mashery is an API management provider that's, I think Tibco now owns them. And um, they used to have the billionaires club is what they called it. The the number of APIs that have over a billion API calls. And, and then my friend Daniel from Netflix at the time, he's now at New York Times. He came and said, and they opened up and said, hey, one of the billionaires club is Netflix. They're our customers and they're, you know, they're in the billionaires club. And Daniel said, why do we want to be in the billionaires club? We don't want chatty APIs. We don't want, you know, we want meaningful volume. If it's meaningful, billions of APIs calls. But you're also, you're with this club, you're kind of incentivizing me to, uh, and my developers to make chatty APIs. And so what you're talking about is it's, actually being able yeah. to see that and, and measure the meaning of, of those API, of, of that value being generated. Absolutely. I mean, that way, the billion is essentially a vanity matrix. And yeah. how do we get out of that to see if you're actually delivering customer value? So how do you... And, and of course, like you said, the incentives. So how do you... How do you... So how do I incentivize API developers to care about the business metrics? They care about the thing, the pain points they have as far as uh, what they need. They need, it's got, the API has to be up. It's got to be performant. Those, those very technical details. How do we get development teams? How do we incentivize them to care about business metrics? I think that's where API as products are very different from all other products is because what I've seen is because APIs are used by developers, developers are actually quite engaged and passionate about how the API is evolving and uh, how it's being used. So most, in, in my experience, I think developers have been very active partners to, to me as a product manager to actually uh, shape the, the experience and uh, I think it definitely that that's the aspect of API products that is very different from all other products out there. But I would say I would they already that. have opinions. Yeah. And I would say they have opinions and they're probably not being tapped properly and understood properly because you have to kind of drag things out of developers a lot of times. If if, if like you don't ask, you're probably they're probably not going to volunteer it. And so it takes a confident product manager and someone who's aware to be able to, to, to start talking about API operations at the business level and, and establish what those metrics should be. And the developers are going to care and, and they'll, they'll think about them and they'll contribute to them. They're just not being, um, they're not being engaged as part of the process. They're just ex expected to deliver the API and keep it up and, and from an operational standpoint. Exactly. It's like people are not asking the developers for uh, for their their inputs. So I think there's also an aspect of when when I present some of the metrics I'm following from a product standpoint to developers to my developers, they inevitably ask me what that means. 
and why it's important. And that's a great way to start thinking about how the work that they are doing is having a business impact. And from there, working into how do we improve these metrics? Because this is why it matters. Yeah, yeah I'm always fascinated by the the classic IT and business divide, you know, that has, I think has been around for a long time. I mean, I have a 30 year career and, and this divide has always existed. And I think if you talk to business folks, this divide exists because of IT and technical folks and developers saying, oh, stay away, this is tech, this is wizardry. You don't need to understand this. And then developers are saying, you know, the business folks don't come over here and, and engage with us and, I think there's various reasons for why that exists, but it feels like, I mean, that's what we need that balance in the API spaces. We need product managers, more business domain experts um, involved in, in the design process and, and, and developing these products. But we, we have to have developers there and we don't need just developers just to develop. We need them to understand the business implement and have a feedback, be part of that feedback, add at, you know, be part of what we measure and have a stake in that they don't need to be ignorant of it and so i think that's that's the process that i think you outline here is is it, it's a process for all stakeholders that are involved absolutely i really like the fact that you brought up domain knowledge because one of the things that i have seen of course you know the, the bigger aspect of how in the, the divide between it and and business but there is also this aspect specifically in the API space where if as a developer, I'm trying to work with a FinTech API, a business person would assume that I know what disputes mean or I know what invoices mean. Or if I'm working with uh, any marketing or, or any other domain specific APIs, most of the business people creating those products kind of assume that I know those domain terminologies that the APIs were designed around. So one of the things that uh, we're trying to do at PayPal actually is trying to create some kind of uh, payments 101 that is geared towards developers so that they don't have to feel like they don't have the domain expertise because a lot of times developers are are individuals there you know i've seen a lot of times these are like ceos bootstrapping their their application or these are developers who had an idea and they're building an application so it's not always one or the other how do we kind of give them the domain expertise or at least the the key terms for them to get started and it actually does help them get started with with apis so i think uh, there's a lot of opportunity to bridge the gap, and I don't think we, uh, you know, any of the, uh, both developers can learn a little bit of domain knowledge and business people can try to learn a little bit about technology. I often end up, you know, kind of just being very uh, honest, and I tell my developers I have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> uh, and I think... Uh, we we all just have to have those conversations. Yeah, no, I like it. I mean, it's so important. It's how we're going to fix all of this. Most of the API illness, and and because APIs drive so many applications, there's um, there's a lot of illness behind the applications they power. And most of these are because of this divide and this lack of communication, and and honestly, the lack of stake business stakeholders involved in the process, and the really the the last five years that have gotten me the most excited about APIs is because of open API being available in YAML, more more tooling out there to make to allow non-developers to get involved in the API lifecycle that I'm seeing more more folks uh, involved in the conversation. and I'm seeing more diverse folks. It's not just your usual class of developers involved in the conversation. And I think, those voices having a lot of different voices domain experts but also business other um, involved in the conversation is important and that i think levels the playing field a little bit and helps us deliver more meaningful more purposeful apis less waste and we're able to move forward faster and and the world's just a better place if we all work together to do this so i was a little I feel now I'm looking around everywhere, like where are we missing information on to get people up to speed on, you know, 
being an API product manager, like, is there a career path, like, to become a product manager for an API? Like, I mean, how, if you had to explain how to get here to someone else, how would you explain how, them, how they should onboard with the role? I think that it's it shouldn't be a barrier to entry to like you have to have to be a developer to be an API product manager. I think a lot of a lot of people who don't have developer background I think can also make it as API product managers. I think everybody should really lean on their their strengths. So if somebody has a good domain expertise, uh, for example, if somebody had a great knowledge of marketing, then they just have to learn a little bit about APIs and they might make a great API product manager for a marketing API. So I think just fill in the gaps and uh, nobody knows everything. So we always keep learning. So I think learning mindset combined with knowing your strengths and weaknesses and trying to work on those weaknesses to, uh, to grow. I think anybody can, can be a, a product manager or an API product manager. Um, one of the interviews I did last week um, was someone who, who started out as a, a technical writer, and they were kind of the front line of, of problems with the design of the API, um, you know, trickling downstream, and they had to, like, they were affected, and customers and, and users were, were hitting them, and then they ended up, had the opportunity to become product manager and jump in and change things and make them better. And they took the opportunity. So I think I, I think I want to spend a lot more time illuminating these these paths for people to 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 find their way and realize. And I appreciate you saying you don't have to be a developer because I think that's that's really important. I think like like we said, it's not just um, we need more business users involved in life cycle. We need more business users owning the product and defining the product and shaping the process and and then shaping the knowledge we put out there. So um, how, how, do you, how do you get your knowledge and information from the space? What do you do? I mean, you, you, you touched on it a little bit. You read books about APIs that, that clearly don't have enough on APIs as a product in them. But what else <laughs> do you do? What other practices do you use to gather information and, and knowledge? I think uh, YouTube is a, is a great platform. I, I watch videos on APIs. I constantly search, search for things and also search the same things over and over. A lot of times there's new content coming up uh, over time. So if, if I search for something three months ago, it's actually possible that somebody made something about it more recently. So a lot of times I, I search for the same things over and over on different platforms. So when I was looking into API maturity, I kept looking for it and Every few weeks, I go back and I search again. It's like, is there anything new? Uh, I also follow a lot of people on Twitter. Uh, try to spend at least a few minutes on Twitter every day. I that's why I have a more API and developer focused Twitter handle, uh, and that's the information I'm looking for. Is just see how the developer community is is talking about APIs or uh, any kind of knowledge, like a lot of times I'm learning about cool projects people are doing, not necessarily dependent on APIs. So I think uh, YouTube, I also spend some time on Udemy occasionally. I really like Udemy uh, and books and Twitter. I think those are my, my platforms. <laughs> I like it. I like it. I would say it, it reflects mine. I would say except for the videos, I'm not as I produce a lot of videos. Maybe that's part of my problem. I don't consume as much as I, I should. And if it is, it's usually a shorter, shorter video that I, I don't have a lot of time in my day and I wish I had more time. Um, what's, the, what's the ideal length video for you to be able to watch it? Does it matter if it's based upon the content or? No, I think there's definitely an ideal length. I think uh, depending on the information, I think anywhere from three minutes to 20 minutes, I think 20 minutes is the ceiling for me, uh, especially yeah. just because videos that are very dense in information, I think at 20 minutes, because it is a one-sided communication, 20 minutes tends to be the ceiling. At 20 minutes, you kind of lose attention. Uh, 
so I just I try to even even if there is a longer video, I watch it in pieces. And so so I agree. That's a that's a nice sweet spot. Especially with I would TikTok, say. you know the 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 statistics that we are seeing with TikTok because the length the length of video that people can have attention for is reducing day by day. On on TikTok, mm -hmm. the ideal length of a video is actually seven seconds which is so short <laughs> uh, and it, it's kind of interesting to see how uh, I've been thinking a lot about like, you know, there's so much technology and coding people actually teach on TikTok. Uh, and I've been thinking about like, if I were to explain my PayPal APIs on a TikTok video, can I actually do that in one minute? I don't have an answer yet, <laughs> but I think uh, it, it's, yeah, it's something that we, we have to think about because like going back to what I said around how people learn, if we want people to learn about our product, we have to understand how they learn so that we can present that information in a format that is, that is, that works for them. Agreed. And I, my, one of my missions at Postman right now with my team is um, do, everything we do has got to be demonstrable and hands-on something you can do. And I have what's called, I call API blueprint. So, I distill a lot of different learnings down into these these seemingly short texts. They're texts, so it's like a, a one-page outline. How do you do uh, API testing? How do you do uh, API documentation? Just a one sheet on it. And I shared it with someone uh, from my sales team, and she was looking through it. So I have like 40 or 50 of these blueprints, and she's all, these are great. Like the information, the content's nice and dense. So I need each one as a as a sixty second video, <laughs> and I was like, "Oh, okay, yeah, I will get to work on that." Because and she's in LinkedIn. She's like, "All everybody I'm targeting, they they don't you know what you, your content's great. It's great to read. Uh, you know, two percent will read it. The rest just want a sixty second video. Here's the concept. Give it to me. All right, let me go on my way." And so I I kind of. I want I want to check back in with you on what your your overall developer experience toolbox looks like, filled down to a 30, sec, 30 or sixty second video. Is it possible? Yeah, there's a there's a few different ways that I'm I have thought about it because I've been thinking about how to how to have some standard uh, checklist of building a great API experience. And one of the things I was thinking about was like, what if what if every every page for an API had like a small video that kind of runs with the documentation. Like maybe a, a short, you cannot make a short video about all of the APIs, but you could potentially make 30 second videos for each endpoint, potentially. Could you do it for each parameter and header too, for an endpoint so that I can understand <laughs> what the headers are for? <laughs> that might be overkill. But the reason I've been thinking about it is actually I was I was looking into I'm very curious about how much text there is in the API space like documentations are just like they're so vast and I was really curious about how many people have reading disabilities and are there developers who have reading disabilities how do they learn APIs because everything is just text I really appreciate you talking through this with me. I um I look forward to your your work on maturity and analytics and 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 that cracking open of it. I mean the overall product manager stuff I think it needs to be addressed. That there's a lot of great stuff there, but your cracking open of maturity and analytics and that that multi dimension that that exists there and I think is is worth exploring more. So please if you publish anything else, share anything else, um, share it with me. I would love to share it with the audience and 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 tell do some storytelling around it. But then some of these other areas, this is going to be a full episode, um, but we have these TLDR episodes, which are the short little content um, pieces. And there's a couple other areas I would like to revisit with you there. So um, um, we'll, we'll definitely be in touch. Um, so thank you for being with me. I really appreciate your time today and coming. Absolutely. This was really fun. I think we got to talk about a lot of various different things. So I'm really glad we could, you know, uh, look at such a variety of different topics.
it was really fun. Thanks for having me. Thanks again to Deepa for stopping by. For more on Deepa, you can find her on Twitter at one sprint at a time or on LinkedIn, but you can also visit developer.paypal.com. You can subscribe to the Breaking Changes podcast on postman.com slash events slash breaking dash changes. I'm your host, Ken Lane, and until next time, cheers. <laughs>